There is an ancient battle cry in British lore. It was shouted together in unison as soldiers entered the battlefield to confront and conquer their opponents. And the cry was, for king and country. It was a rallying cry, a reminder that the soldiers and their efforts to vanquish the foes in front of them were not to be seen as conquering for personal gain, but rather for glorification of their sovereign leader. It was intended to strip away one's own sense of identity, making the flank of soldiers to become one in unity with each other, stronger than any one soldier could be on their own. It's unclear where the battle cry's origins can be traced, but it is not too great of a leap to imagine the link between that battle cry of, of king and, for king and country and the intent of the doctrine of discovery, which was given in the 15th century. As way of a brief overview, the doctrine of discovery was a papal bull, which means an edict issued by the pope who at that point in time was leader of all Christians. We didn't have denominational delineation. This edict stated that all Christians, which really means all people because Christianity was a religion of the state throughout the world, all Christians should seek to colonize all the globe, claiming land in the name of their sovereign leader and in the name of God. We are a nation founded out of those efforts and the lingering effects of the doctrine of discovery. And Americans have a complicated history around the observance and celebration of the upcoming feast day of Thanksgiving as a result. For king and country may very well have been the battle cry that rang throughout the continents during this time of displacement and violence towards indigenous people and their land throughout the world. The king, the pope, who were real people, they were seeking conquest to support the legitimacy of their reign. Now, our system of government in the United States was intentionally created to avoid kingship and the birthright that is assumed with royal leadership However, we are people of history, and we are people who are living currently, and so there's enough king and queens in our relative consciousness for us to have developed a general understanding of what it means to be king. There are many iterations of this royal term, but a general understanding that is common that we might all have about kings as rulers includes kings having the ultimate authority over the rest of us. They're the highest of people in a hierarchical system of power. No one has authority or sovereignty or power over them. And as power goes, the need for folks below them to revere them, to honor them, to treat them specially, set apart, is inherent to what it means to be royalty. Now, with that in mind, happy Christ the King Sunday. <laughs> hmm. Today's observance in our liturgical life finds us in the last Sunday of the church year. Each January, we start a new chronological year. Each fall, we start a new school year and a new church programming year. But the end of November is when the church year comes to a close. Our readings for today's worship compel us to speak of this kingship of God. In fact, embedded in all of the readings we have today, there is lots of language that supports if God's kingship would be like a sovereign nation's ruler. I did a little sermon research, which you'd want your preacher to do, probably. And I uncovered over 125 scriptural references to God as king. They start in the Hebrew Bible with the longings of the people of Israel 
to escape their bondage and suffering, and they continue all the way through the end of the New Testament with Revelation. As the followers of Christ seek to understand Jesus and what it means to have God come and live among them. Not exactly like a royal king. However, kingship and ruler responsibilities, even royal robes and thrones are mentioned because we struggle and have for a long time with understanding who God is for God's people and how we are called into relationship with a mysterious divinity that escapes our human understanding and, frankly, blows back at our common understanding of royalty as we know it for humans. So we Christians are confronted with the reality that we don't really fully understand what it means to worship and follow Christ the King, the well-beloved Son, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, as it says in our collect. Yet here we are gathered, seeking to understand, yearning to know and love and be loved. We've brought our doubts and our wonderings with us into this tapestry of discipleship seeking. Today's observance of Christ the King forces us to confront what it means if we follow a savior who is our king. Now we as Christians know something about God's reign that is unique and differentiates us from subjects of human kings only who cannot discern what we know because they have flawed human examples of royalty. We, Christians and followers of God, are the products of God's abundant, overflowing, radical love. Unlike human kings, God doesn't need our worship. God doesn't have needs that humans can fill. God simply loves us for existing. God loves our doubting minds, our willful desires that we turn into idols that we worship in no way deter a king who was incarnate and came to live as one of us. Our Christ stood in front of Pilate in that room and answered his questions with a quiet defiance. His act of resistance to the judgment of human rulers bought him a fast track to his crucifixion. And that was done for us, all of us, for the doubters, for the seekers, for the believers, and for the not yet sure if they are believers. Today, we will invite forward three of our parishioners to take their vows to join the order of the Daughters of the King. They have spent months in discernment, and we do so on Christ the King Sunday. No better time. We are staking our claim on the sovereignty of the God who seeks to draw us closer and love us more abundantly than our human minds can fathom. These women have spent their time together with members of our Good Shepherd chapter of Daughters of the King, leading them through their period of intentional and prayerful discernment. They will be joining a worldwide order that has as its vision to know Jesus Christ, to make him known to others, and to become reflections of God's love throughout the world. They're not joining a club. They're seeking a Christ-centered life. We all benefit from this level of devotion to the kingship of God, not to the royal lifestyle that may be our default construct of what it means to be a king but rather to seek to serve as Christ who serves. To see each person as God's own beloved. 
to reflect God's love from within our own selves, which can only be possible with divine intervention into our very creation as being made in God's image. This congregation sees you and your devotion, and we are a better church for your commitment to this life of prayer and service and evangelism. Daughters of the King don't say this. We don't do a battle cry for king and country. That ancient battle cry is right before the bloodletting of acts of war. And it is unwelcome to the ears of our God who sees us as we are. God needs us to never have a battle cry. But be assured that our discipleship is our mantra, our uniting mission. God will seek us to the ends of time. And to worship that sort of king changes us from needing a battle cry to being devoted to discipleship. To respond to that radical love with our often feeble attempts to reflect that love to God and to ourselves and one another. There is no need for us to conquer a soul, to take any land, to make any battle cry. Instead, we are called and we respond to love and to seek the flourishing and dignity of all people. I wonder what the world would be like if we joined with that king, that savior, in seeking to spread love and forgiveness and self-sacrifice as we prayed in our college. All things God created and intended for us would indeed be restored. Amen.